The XY Advisor podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. XY Advisor does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Financial advisors help Australians live better lives, and we're great at it. But what about us? For us to thrive in the coming years, I'm here to ask a very big question. How can we live better, run better businesses, and help more clients along the way? My name is Jessica Brady, and I would love for you to join me as I listen and learn from experts who answer these very big questions. I am lucky enough to record most of my podcasts on Gadigal Land. Perpetual is a dynamic, active manager offering an extensive range of specialist investment capabilities, including Australian and global equities, credit, fixed income, multi-asset, as well as environmental, social and governance, designed to help meet the needs of clients across Australia and New Zealand. Underpinned by our long-standing and market-leading Australian equities capability, Perpetual also offers an extensive contemporary range of funds. As one of Australia's longest-serving and most trusted investment managers, our long-standing commitment is to deliver superior outcomes over the long term to clients. Hello, welcome Nikki. Hi Jess, how are you going? Good. I'm so excited to have you on today as our guest. Now, we've got lots to cover off in terms of you and your journey and the progression and what that's been like. But perhaps before I start, you know, I won't say grilling. Grilling sounds a bit intense, but perhaps before we deep dive into that, I think it would be really great for everyone to get a bit more insight in terms of who you are and a bit more about your story and background. Yeah. Okay. Um, Okay, how far how far back do you want me to go? You can do whatever you like, my dear, so you can tell us whatever you want. Uh, so I guess I'm originally from Toowoomba, which is a little bit outside of, of Brisbane. So mm-hmm. I grew up um, born, bred, Toowoomba girl. So two older brothers, mum, dad, um, primary school, high school, all the way through. I moved to Brisbane a f- soon as I could. So after graduating high school, I had a gap year, which was uh, effectively just so I could save up a bit of cash, move myself to Brisbane and and go through uni. Thought when I went to uni, I was going to um, work in accounting, actually. So that that was um, the discipline that I chose. But in in a part of that process, I I did a finance course and it was one of those lecturers who, who actually sort of switched my, my mindset there and then I sort of majored in finance. So um, outside of that, so in the in the last year of my university degree, one of my mm. uh, tutors approached me and actually said, you know, you're looking for a job inside the industry and, and that's when I got put on to, to My Wealth Solutions. So I started working there in my last year of university and um, have been there since. So... Interesting. And hey, when you went into accounting, did you go into it because you liked numbers and you really didn't know much else about the finance world and that just seems like the natural fit for you or you always convinced accounting was for you and that's why you went to study it? My, my brother's an accountant. Um, so that, that was sort of like part of it. But I also did accounting at school and I was pretty good at it. Numbers have always been my thing. I do not really like grammar, poetry, the arts. It's it's not the way that my brain is set, to, to be oh. frank. So mm-hmm. um, it, it was always going to be something. I, I really liked data analysis as well through, through university, but finance for me just sort of stuck in the respect that there's numbers but people and sort of progression and, and outcomes, which um, I liked. Mm. And had you heard of what financial planners were before you studied that that class or that um, subject that got you into it? No, not at all. I, I'd never really had any exposure to um, the industry. My, my, you know, family wise was never uh, high wealth individual. Mm. 
Because we, we always had, you know, dad and mum put, put us through every extracurricular activity that we wanted to do. There was always that, you know, food on the table. But um, out, outside of that, in terms of their financial planning, it was always self-directed. We, we never had that assistance and I never had that exposure. Yeah, which is interesting for us as a profession when we think through how our young people, particularly young women, are going to learn about this wonderful profession that we have if they don't know it exists. So we're very glad that you found that class and found your way into our world. One of the things that I wanted to talk about with you is around being a para planner. So you were a para planner obviously for a little while before you stepped into the advice sphere. I want to talk about for you when you were a para planner, what it what it looked like you had to be to be a successful advisor. Did you have an idea of, okay, if I really want to make the transition for para planning to advice, I need to have X, Y, and Z as a per- personality style. Was there any sort of assumptions that you'd made around sort of that leap for you? Yeah, I think it was it- – <laughs> Yeah, the thought of that next step was incredibly daunting um, for for me, and I think you know I can see it with even our team coming through. There's there's a couple of the more introverted people who, you know, are a little bit more reserved in in um, the way that they hold themselves and whether or not they feel as confident taking that next step. I I, I don't um, certainly for myself. Uh, it was. It was not something that I thought I was capable of in those early years of of the industry. So even like, you know, I remember back in the day going to the professional development days and being one of three women in the crowd. It wasn't um, it, it wasn't necessarily that we were the predominant gender, nor nor were we the ones that were advisors even within that group. So it, mm. it never really felt like the natural step for for me to go from para planning to advising. I, I was pretty proficient, I, I like to think, in that um, para planning space because I do have that attention to detail and I um, really, really effectively structure everything that I do it has to be correct otherwise I I will not send it out it's just the way that I'm built Mm. um whereas the persona for for the um advisors was always these big personalities that um I, I I didn't have so you're young you're female you're quieter introverted you look around you at these professional development days and you see people that frankly don't look feel or sound like you stylistically and did that sort of in your mind then make you think, okay, I'm good at para planning. I like the numbers. I'm very technically proficient. This is where I stay. Or was there something in the back of your mind that was like, no, even though I don't look, feel, and sound a lot like these people, I'm going to push to the next level. How did that transition or thought process happen for you? Yeah, so I guess in the back of my mind, I always had the goal of being the financial advisor. That, that was always the target. But then my own sort of self, um, uh, yeah, I, I put sort of ceiling limits on on what I thought I was capable of in, in those earlier years. So it took took me a longer time, I would say, to to get to that advice space compared to you know someone with a more outward um, personality. I had a major sort of incident in in my life that caused me to sort of wake up, wake up a little bit and, and just sort of question the fact of, you know, I'm thinking that I want to do these things. I've studied to do these things. I, I've been working in, in this space, but I'm not biting the bullet and just having a crack at it. So uh, it, it shifted my mindset completely to, to just jump in and have a go. Um, and, and fortunately, from, from the moment I did that, it, it was basically, you know, all bets are off. I, I was I was ready um, and I was in a position to execute the work and, and um, onboard clients as, as I went through. So it, it took something drastic for, for me to sort of switch my mindset. And I think even over the time, like naturally now when I go to these professional development days, it's, it's a completely different dynamic. It's a, it's a different makeup to what it was in the past. So I feel like we have progressed a little bit, but I still feel like there, there is this natural persona and this predominant sort of person who maybe is, um, 
uh, the, the typical image of an, of an advisor. If you hadn't have that drastic situation unfold that, that helped push you to be an advisor, do you think you would have got there but it would have taken a lot longer or do you think that ceiling would have stayed for you? Look, it's hard to, to know. I, I think that I think that the ceiling possibly could have stuck. Uh, mm. I don't know if I would necessarily be in the industry today if that was the case because, you know, that, that, that sort of power planning um, space, if you have this vision of something else, it, it can be quite repetitive. Um, so I'm not sure I would have stayed in that, that role um, and I possibly could have switched disciplines. Interesting. Did the advisors that you worked with at the time know that your aspirations was to become an advisor or was that something that you kept quite private? No, they knew. Yeah, they definitely knew. And, and you know, they they were pushing me to, to take that next step and effectively, you know, try my hand at it instead of just saying that I wanted to, but but not putting those wheels in motion. Mm. There's some beautiful, sad research that shows that through a gendered lens, obviously I'm being very um, generic here, but often men will look at sort of what skills it takes to do a role and they might have quite a few of them, but not all of them and think, yeah, cool. I can do most of that. I've, I've got this and I'll, I'll bite it off and figure out the rest of the stuff that I don't know later. But, but often women want to have all of the skills and all of the requirements that's on a role before they feel competent or confident enough to say, yep, cool. I can do every one of those. Does that resonate with you in terms of that situation from paraplanner to advisor? Yeah, absolutely. I think it nails it on the head. (laughs) And so for people who run businesses, it's something to think about because sometimes we put must know or must have. And so we're actually locking out a lot of the workforce where people that are applying for it anyway possibly don't have all of those skills. And so it's an interesting thought-provoking point around when you are looking for talent, how you word your application so that you're appealing to the widest, most diverse pool to get the best candidates. Otherwise, there's a natural fil- filtration system that's happening anyway and you're losing quality candidates before they've even gotten to you and they probably happen to be women by the sounds of it. Or even identifying that talent and, and that sort of personality trait and sort of developing that um, uh, the processes around that person to encourage them to take those those next steps. So, identifying what it is that they need in terms of you know their confidence level to to actually get them to where you know that they are capable of being Mm, absolutely and that's easier when they're in the business because you you've already you've proven yourself and you've you've proven your competency and your trustworthiness and your value alignment to the business and so if you find a good power planner you hold on to them for dear life and hope that they never never leave but also acknowledge that a lot of them do have aspirations. But the point that you made before is a really interesting one around that you perhaps wouldn't have stayed in the industry or the profession if that next opportunity for you hadn't become available. That's very thought-provoking. So how did it happen? How did the transition from when so the life-changing event happened, you had the the aha moment that said, Nikki, I gotta, you got to do this, babe. You, you're qualified, you're competent, you got this, let's go. Tell me, and the advisors obviously around you supported you, how did you then transition? Did you take over a book of existing people? What happened from there? Yeah, I started from, from scratch. So um, My Wealth Solutions as a whole has got a marketing division within it and we have a fairly strong internet lead presence. So we, we get quite a, a number of leads from SEO, Google, et cetera, et cetera. So um, everything that I have built has been from an organic um, process. We, I haven't purchased a book of business um, and or taken over you know, any of the existing advisors' clients. And as someone who considers themselves more reserved and more introverted, Tell me about what it was like in those first few sort of interactions. Yeah. How did it go and what knowledge can you impart to people that are perhaps going to be on this journey in the future? Yeah, so um, I don't like to to fail. I don't, I don't think anyone, you know, necessarily does, but I do think people, some people are more in tune with it and probably more accepting of, of that sort of outcome. For, for me, it is uh, a pretty big deterrent to to 
to not achieve what I set out to achieve. So it was a matter of preparation. So I had, um, so the existing advisors, Ben and Guy, had given me their framework. They're very, um, you know, the frameworks and scripts that they used to develop way, way back in the day. So I, I sort of extended beyond them. I created my own and much more elaborate outline of what I want that meeting to follow the, the you know the gist of, of it how the pattern will happen um, and, and then the conversations around certain sort of moments that could pop up you know if, if this situation arises these are my go-to sort of conversation pieces that I could rely upon or the tools that I could use to help encourage that client conversation or, or, or um, uh, understanding so I was very prepared and, and I know sometimes that that can be uh, a disadvantage you could be thrown off trail and, and not know how to get back on to to the conversation so that that was a fairly real risk but I, I was fortunate enough to um the people I was in front of were quite casual um and adaptable for for me and, and basically let me control the meeting which is what I needed in those first conversations from there everything sort of developed out where I, I don't have to follow a set format if, if I'm sitting in front of someone who is very direct um, and and has to control the meeting, I can sort of move with that person as opposed to having to be the lead. So that that just took time and practice. And so these scripts helped you build sort of a framework and some psychological safety so that you felt that no matter what was thrown at you, you'd come prepared, you'd thought about what to do. No doubt situations would have arisen that had gone outside of that sort of script and skill set. But as you said, you sort of built your confidence because the first few, <laughs> thankfully, <laughs> sound like they, they were easy ones um, or, or people that were quite happy to sort of follow the the bubble or, or the, um, the ball, I should say. Um, yep. And so do you think it worked when you look back at those scripts and how it went? You know, if, you're, if you were um, going to do it again, would you follow a similar methodology? Yes. Yep, I would. I, I mean, even in my meetings today, I, I have like a set sort of agenda that, that is just my now mental um, checklist that I, I follow in, in meetings and it, it very much is reflective of those those first sort of pieces that we put together. The, the other thing that we would do is I'd sit down with either Guy or Ben with the snapshot, so the, the client sort of bird's eye view of scenario and, and what their sort of general goals were and, and we would basically workshop the, the meeting before I went into that meeting. So it would give me a little bit of an outline of, you know, they might throw a few little sticky questions at me and, and see how I react and that, that was that was extremely helpful. And so you had that real-time feedback loop because someone was there sort of helping you understand what tricky things and curly questions might come up and how you're going to approach them. And so how long have you been giving advice for now? Ah, uh, that's so... It would be five years. So Ooh. in the industry since 2013, um, but formally in, in front of clients for five years. And so what do you say to an advisor who's got an amazing power planner, but the power planner's a little bit reserved, not as sort of outspoken as they are, but very competent, very technical, and has ambitions to become an advisor, what would you say to that advisor who, or the, the practice owner who thinks that perhaps you need to have more of an extroverted, outgoing personality style to be successful in an advice landscape? I would say I disagree with that uh, that sort of thought process. I, I think you should harness, you know, that, or, or you know, um, cradle that person and, and their skill set to get them to where they want to go because I would be pretty confident that if they're demonstrating those skills in the back office, the admin, the power planning space, that that would certainly carry through and, and they would be able to nurture those client relationships um, quite well, both in new business or retaining existing business. I mean, obviously I baited you. I, I knew you were going to say that. But I think that there is a there, – there's method to my madness, Dickie, because you and I spoke about this a little while ago and – there really is sort of a an archetype of what an advisor is. And I think it turns a lot of people who aren't naturally like that, it either does two things to me. It either makes them look at that and think, well, that's not me, therefore 
I can't do this. That's not the thing for me. Or they have to then put on that persona, which is not them, and it's not authentic. And it never works from a long-term sustainability perspective because you're not being authentically you. And so, and I say full disclosure, I'm quite a loud, extroverted, confident person. Um, And so I'm I'm probably on the other end of the spectrum, but I want to hold space for saying that there shouldn't just be one way and one type of way. And I'm a very passionate ambassador for diversity. And I don't think we've talked about this sort of diversity enough. Hmm. Yeah. I I think... (sighs) There's the initial challenge of getting these type of people into these roles within the industry, but uh, from a client's point of view, if if you've you know, tracked the financial services industry over the last decade plus and you, you feel like they have an image of what the advisor is and if you walk into that meeting and you're completely different to this boisterous uh, individual that they've got in the back of their mind – and you're genuine to to who you are and you can legitimately help their financial situation, they're going to be comfortable with that and they would see through any sort of false um, your advertisement of yourself straight away. Mm, totally, totally, totally. And just thinking about it, like I think what we've done in the past is said, okay, the people that are not as extroverted possibly are better at technical components of advice and not as good at the face-to-face ongoing relationship components of advice. And so we've sort of pigeonholed people if they do become advisors to be more of the technical, uh, almost non-client facing roles, which again, I would imagine you sort of disagree that that is their capability. Most people can like really understand exactly what not not only is their compliance probably going to be good, which is you know uh, happy days. What, what that's part of the process, but um, they they will be able to understand that client and then carry them through not the SOA implementation or you know those those questions a long time or, or the review process. They they will understand and, and um, like execute exactly what the client needs so i think that feedback loop between advisor and client would be actually you know it's given their personality it it would be quite um effective their their issue or or my issue tends to be getting bogged down and in in control um of, of that process sometimes you know wanting to be on every part of that time management wise it's it's just not possible i need to have that team around me that i can rely on um and, and be confident in in their execution process that that's probably one of the major drawbacks of of having th- that personality is you know you want to be on top of everything mm, let's talk about that for a minute so you were a highly successful paraplanner you transitioned to a brave new world which is advice how did you then work with your power planner, because that would have been a really hard process to let go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was super hard. And I'm pretty anal about certain things. Like I just, um, I just am, it, it's just who I am. So, um, fortunately, with the, don't get me wrong. I have butted heads, um, a, a couple of times with different power planners with me wanting things done a particular way whereas you know the other advisors who are happy for the technical people to do the technical work and then they take the work and communicate it uh, that they they can let that go i'm less inclined to to be able to let that go but fortunately if we get two technical minds together you know generally we can make a little bit of a plan of attack about how we're going to handle that and so do you have a power planner that works exclusively with you? Do you have power planning in-house? What does that look like for you right now? Yeah, yeah. So we have um, – it, it's changed over the years. At, at the current state of it is that we have um, associate advisors who run our power planning and we also have outsourced power planning who work hand-in-hand hand with those guys. And so the checking process for you or the feedback loop for you, how have you embedded that? in your framework or your process now? 
Yep. So everything from an advice um, direction comes out immediately after the meeting and then it's picked up by the associate drafted for, for the external power planners and then it comes back. It, it goes through the associate advisor before it lands with myself and, and then it's vetted from from my point of view before it goes to presentation. So there's quite a few points uh, across the process. Yeah. And presumably that trust level needed to be built over time so that you could feel really confident handing things to the associate because they seem to be the linchpin to make sure that the external power planner gets it done in the way that you're looking for to ensure that there's no rework or confusion with what exactly you're wanting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It it takes some time um, onboarding new people, getting them in in your process. Um, It it naturally does take some time and and sometimes you will you will inevitably have a little bit of a delay in some of the advice production. It's it's just you know part and parcel with the process. But they're all growing pains. If we're going to want to expand, we're going to need that support um, in order to keep the business tracking the way that we want it to track. Hmm. Interesting. I can imagine for someone that really does value that that level of um, control, not in a bad way, in a good way. I feel like we've got negative connotations to the word control. Um, it would be really hard. It would be really hard to let go and understand that commercially, this isn't the right way for you to spend your time and energy, but still have the focus and the uh, rigor that you need to have good quality advice documents. It's a fascinating, complicated battle. Hmm. Yeah, did you do have to? I think work as a part of a team, which means you know, the, if if I see an email that goes out that's not perfectly um, positioned in the way that I would have done it, if it still gets what I need to the client, that's what we need to happen. Well done, you for letting go on what mm-hmm. you can yeah. and need to. It's been a long <laughs> time. <Good> process, <laughs> trust me. <laughs> <laughs> so. I want to talk about you making partner. Mm, okay. You made partner, which is really <laughs> exciting. So first, huge congrats. Thank you. It's um yeah, it was a pretty big step. It's a massive step. Can we talk about the journey to partner and you know what were the milestones that you were working towards or the get like did you have a really methodical plan with the other partners? How did the sort of partner process work for you? And and obviously tell me to go away if this is too sort of I like to I like I'm nosy. So I ask all the things and you just push back on the things that you don't want to talk about. But um, you know, it, I'm fascinated to understand partnership processes in every business. And I want to know whether there was um a really clear roadmap for you to make partner. Was it something that you had to push a lot to become partner, or is it something that was presented to you in terms of this is where we think you could go and this is how you can get there? Mm, okay. Well, so I the the partner process that we've gone through is probably well you can correct me if i'm wrong but um i don't think it's probably the traditional sort of setup so uh, essentially what's happened is i, I had a portion of uh, own, like very very small portion of ownership inside of my wealth solutions um over oh, the years. Yeah, it was paid as like a um a loyalty bonus scheme, but th- th- that company itself is is you know quite large at this point. So for me to buy into that, n- not only would you know that that sort of pool of partners become three, uh, which wasn't something that the the primary directors Ben and Guy were too keen to do, but the percentage ownership would be quite small. So I wouldn't have had too much control um in the direction that i wanted to to take so instead my clients have effectively been split out into my wealth solutions too and guy and ben own 25 percent each and i own 50 percent of that entity so um that that is how it's positioned for the moment that was an idea that was presented to me from Guy and Ben. So it wasn't necessarily always a part of my dream to have and run my own business, but it's something that sort of developed uh, as as time has gone on because na- naturally uh, as an ad- employed financial advisor, th- there's a ceiling limit to, to what I could have offered my wealth solutions Hmm. Uh, and and, you know that sort of 
direction of, of what I wanted to do was, was also, you know, not as tailored to, to my end outcome as I probably would have liked. So now with this shift, I, I can control one, how I grow my own team, but two, what I do personally over time with uh, my education pathways or the niche that I want to specialize in over time. Interesting. Can we talk a little bit about the the first business, not number two, which is the one that you've got sort of the majority equity in? So you were given a teeny tiny portion of equity, may not be teeny tiny, but just from what you're saying, I think it might be, um, of equity as an employee, as a loyalty reward. Did that hmm. happen when you were an advisor? Did that happen when you were a power planner? I think it's always interesting around retention of staff and what people are offering to keep quality talent. Yeah, it happened. So I was originally hired at My Wealth Solutions as a power planner. So like on my first day, Ben literally gave me, I'd never seen an SOA in my life. <laughs> he gave me an SOA. And he Welcome. said, here's a new client situation. This is the strategies see what you can do. Um, so that, that was my introduction to, to advice. Um, but it, it's, and then what happened is the original, like the CSO had left. So I got moved into to that role and, and the boys assumed that power planning back in, in their workload. So from, from there that when the, when the business built out, that's when I moved back into power planning before going to associate, before going to, um, advisor. So it, the, the bonus itself, the retention bonus, the equity portion was, um, paid initially when I was a client service officer, I believe, if I'm correct, uh, and then second instalment from from there when I possibly was an associate. Um, but it was all time-related, performance-related, loyalty, ESP, employee shares um, program. And you can tell me to go away, but did it make you feel more wedded to the company because you were part owner? I think it probably could have if it was more like if it was it had a bit more reach about it um or possibly you know the the bit more significance around the the numbers or or what it meant it it was pretty nice to know that they wanted me to be a part of the business and that's why that was on offer mm. um that that was certainly was very happy with that, but it, it would have been nice to see like a longer vision for from what that meant. Um, but it just, you know, that that pathway never crystallized and they presented this other pathway, which was the ownership, but, you know, separation as well. Yeah. Okay, cool. I just think it's interesting to understand, you know, from the perspective of the receiver, what did you feel? How did you think about it? Did it mean that, you know, you were, you were, and everyone's different, right? But uh, were you therefore, you know, really invested long, long, long term in them as a company? And, you know, listening to you, it sounds like if you are going to do that for staff, really understanding, you know, that they know what it means and that they then feel really empowered to be on the journey of making sure the business is successful, but also them understanding, well, what does this actually mean for me over the long term and what is that progression pathway I think for a long time we've locked equity out of people that aren't revenue producers or advisors. And so it's really interesting to hear that that was something that was presented to you much earlier than that in your journey. Yeah. 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 No, uh, it was, um, I was extremely grateful to, to get offered that in, in the role that I was in um, and on the timeline that I, I was. I just, I, I think it was just that vision and, and that sort of clarity around what that vision was that was the missing piece. Hmm. And so now we have this sort of uh, two number two version, which uh, you sort of have the majority control over. What have been the learnings or the surprises for you now that effectively you are sort of the business owner there? Are there things that you are like, oh my gosh, if I'd have known about X, Y, or Z before this, I would have done X, Y, or Z? If I had have known what I'd known today, I would have pushed for this a lot earlier. Um, knowing that this was an option, then I would have been keen to pursue it as soon as I possibly could. One of the biggest surprises has been 
probably that HR element is not um, you're hiring and hiring my own staff and then running their workflow and managing that alongside of them. That has been quite time consuming and probably wasn't something I inbuilt into my expectation when I was thinking about going this path. So uh, I'm still wanting to keep my full advisor load because I'm still building my client base. But then Mm. this tagged on, which um, has just meant that the, you know, the time committed to this process has been a lot higher than I expected. Um, But I should have expected that. I just don't know why I didn't at the time. (laughs) I mean, we all, (laughs) you know, staff and um, HR, those, that sort of part of the business is always going to um, take your concentration. And um, yeah, I probably didn't heed that advice as much as I should have. But you never really know. My analogy for this is it's like having a baby. I think, because I haven't got one, but I think it's like, you know, you know that babies in the beginning don't sleep and they require a lot of attention. And, you know, you know, but you don't really know until you have one what it's really, really going to be like. Um, and I think anyone that manages staff or anyone that has a business is probably sitting in their car or wherever they're listening to this going, mm, yes, <laughs> with what she's saying. So how do you manage that? This is really tricky and I've been there too. Um, how many staff do you have? Are you likely to bring on more staff in the next little while? And whilst you're building your business, being the face and managing quite a lot of the other things and trying to have some form of life. How does this work as someone, and I'm, I'm selfishly asking this because I'm still trying to find the answer, as someone who is quite organised, perhaps you've cracked the code. How do you do this, Nikki? <laughs> um, uh, so we have three uh, in, in my team, so three plus myself plus an external outsourcer, so um, five as a group. We are currently looking to hire uh, a new CSO to come on board, which will allow one of my existing team members to, to progress in her pathway. Um, and then so to, to one of the guys who's just passed his CEO exam, um, he's going through his professional year and he will be able to see some clients um, in, in the following quarter. So, that's the the plan now in terms of we have a calendar block or in our um every week where we have a set allocation for an hour meeting each staff member and that is to go through their workflow everything is tracked um through through various pipelines so that we can bring up summary sheets and we can go through exactly you know where's this client's implementation at where's this client's review at or where's this soa prep at so that that is how we we manage it. it it's set in stone in the calendar no clients can book over it and and it's a place for burning questions every month it is intended um for us to have a bit of a bigger conversation around you know, what are the roadblocks that they're in, um, encountering what what is the the next step for their progression plan is there any issues that they're, they're sort of facing that we can help with um, just to try and keep the communication open um, and resolve any issues or, or, or know where their head's at and so it sounds like there's sort of two parts to this there's the everyday operational running where's the workload at what's holding you back what's happening from an operational perspective and then there is a different quite distinct meeting that is progression for you as a person where are you at where are you moving to how do we make sure you're supported along the way is that right yeah yes that, that that's the goal i will admit that you know that um we have our set in stone six monthly career planning session and mm. then or formal review so that that will happen that that sort of one-on-one extended time is it sort of falls out naturally in our catch-ups um but it, i mean the goal would be to have a bit more of in-depth conversation about how they're feeling about the role of business in general and and make sure that they're still um still happy because that staff process hiring and and um developing is one expensive and and two time consuming Mm. And so hard, yeah, so hard. Yes. And getting it wrong is so hard and heartbreaking for everyone involved. No one enjoys any of that as well. I can imagine you feel the same. Yeah, exactly. And so would it be fair to say it's a 
about one day a week that you would spend on the business between all of the staff meetings and perhaps some other business style stuff that you would do and then maybe the other time is client facing or what does that sort of mix look like for you? Uh, so I would say all the business stuff in terms of the numbers, the the because uh, we've we've had quite a big changeover process from the revenue being directed to my wealth one to my wealth two, which is mm. still you know ongoing at the moment. Um, but that that all of that is really hitting after hours, weekend time. Um, the the week itself is is for new business, existing business, or um, uh, you know, just random ad hoc follow-ups, emails, the the typical sort of stuff, but half-day allocation purely for internal HR. Cool. Uh, are you having any work-life? I would. Is it work-life balance? Is it <laughs> work-life balance? Any tips for anyone that's doing this? Because I burnt myself out demonstrably trying to do this and fit everything in. Have you managed to find a system or a process or a way that works for you or are you just happy to acknowledge this is the tricky point and I'm just going to keep soldiering on, which is what I did, and take it from there? I, I'm i a, I'm a worker. I've always been a worker. If I've, I've got a random day off that doesn't seem to, you know, have anything happening, I, I will be – just checking on emails and doing a few bits and bobs because that's the way that I am built. It, it doesn't really – I'm sure it stresses my husband out, um, but more <laughs> so than it does me. It, it's, I'm sort of built this way. I am an advocate for if you need a day, take a day. Like it's, it's – sometimes everyone will hit that cap and it, it's if you just – tap out for that 24 hours um pretty strong believer that you can sort of come back and and be ready to go the next day i haven't cracked any sort of code (laughs) 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 um i just i believe that this is the part where you put in to get established so that you can get a bit more of that lifestyle balance back. But I inevitably would never see myself in a position where, you know, the majority of my time isn't taken up by work because it is what I love doing. Mm. Yeah. Awesome. Any other, before we get into, I could ask you lots of, well, I already have asked you lots of questions. Um, uh, any other pieces of advice you would give? I, I want to talk specifically to the people that, have aspirations to be advisors but are scared about the journey or who have aspirations to go and present perhaps an equity model to business owners that, you know, that when they're ready to step up to take that next level, like do you have anything else that we haven't covered today that you would say to them? I would just say that, you know, one of my probably biggest regrets is not stepping up sooner um, and not sort of having those conversations with the directors in a constructive manner. It was always in, um, you know, something's gone wrong or um, I'm feeling unhappy and, and then it was, you know, those conversations weren't constructive because they were after the issues had sort of been around for a while. So I think approaching them to get a feel for what their vision is for the business and then seeing how you work into that vision is pretty pretty important because if they don't have that professional development in mind, if they don't want to grow the business and you want to be an advisor, maybe it's not the right fit. Um, whereas if, you know, you, you can align your, your two um goals and objectives then you know that they're they're going to be open to it so if you put the numbers behind them and you put the work to them they should be open to those conversations yeah absolutely and it's about not wasting your time and feeling dispirited along the way right yeah yeah things things do take time i think you know that's the other side of things you you have to be a little bit patient you have to be able to commit to the work and and demonstrate that you're capable um Mm. of doing it so it's 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 got to go both ways Mm, because equity is like marriage. Like you need to date first, right, I think. Um, 
And, and I see this a little bit, like we've had people come to us uh, for advisor roles and they've been really short on their time frame around equity. And we're like, whoa, we didn't even know you yet. You didn't even know us yet. You got, we got a date first before we decide whether this is good for everyone. Otherwise that can be really dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it's a big, you know, it's a big decision to introduce someone into your, um, your business. It's effectively like another baby. So, mm. um, you're welcoming them into that family and that all of the legal financial stuff that's going to come with it, you've, you've got to be pretty comfortable together. So mm. give it time. Give it time. Us millennials, we don't like hearing that, but it is important. <laughs> 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 I've loved chatting to you today. Thank you so much for I uh, sort of bullied. Bullied is a strong word with negative connotations, but possibly the right word sort of bullied Nikki into being <laughs> on the podcast <laughs> because I had heard amazing things about her and I wanted to hold space for having this really important conversation. So before we get into rapid fire questions, I want to say a massive thank you. And how can people learn more about you and your business if they want to find you so you can find me on linkedin um mm -hmm. would probably be the easiest path to to go yep. um otherwise i mean the the my world solutions office number is on the website along with the information around you know um the services that we do the team if it's in alignment with your vision um that then just get in touch with the team that they'll give you my email address and then we can take it from there wonderful okay let's round out today's chat with some rapid fire questions are you ready yes <laughs> um what is one thing that you do to look after your mental health i uh, go to the gym so exercise and is that often mm, the goal is three to four times per week but winter no nah, three mm. times three times is good yeah. uh, we've already covered this a little bit i think but i'm just going to ask you just in case it's a different answer to what we've talked about what is a piece of advice that you would give to younger nikki i would say be a little bit more confident in yourself and your capability and approach conversations, meaning those meaningful conversations about where you want to go uh, earlier and, and be a bit more constructive uh, around how you're broaching those subjects. Amazing. Do you have something that's on your bucket list that you haven't ticked off yet? I really want to spend at least a month in Italy and just go around uh, my husband's italian we we love everything to do with italian food wine the culture so that that that's up there for sure i think if you have an italian husband it's compulsory that you do that <laughs> i agree <laughs> uh last question do you have a book for me to read as part of my fake book club oh i have a couple um the my my probably favorite book is the Brain That Changes Itself, it's by Norman George, but um, it, it's about, you know, what the human brain is capable of. So it's, it's something that the topic that I got pretty interested in years, in years ago. Um, and the book itself was, yeah, I, I really enjoyed that book. Oh, my gosh, amazing. Thank you so much. Nikki, I've loved chatting with you today. Thank you so much for being the podcast guest for this week. Thank you, Jess. Thank you so much for having me. 